today in Dave's Garage, the AW1000 watt 48 volt e-bike kit from Amazon.com with some surprising top speeds and hill climbing ability. This is the AW1000 watt 48 volt hub drive e-bike kit from Amazon.com as installed by my 10 year old Schwinn suspension mountain bike. I am also using the same vendor's 48 volt lithium ion battery pack and their mounting rack. The 1000 watt hub drive has its advantages and disadvantages relative to your two primary options, those being the front wheel drive and the crank drive. I do not believe front drives are safe on these bikes as they were never designed to be pulled by their front forks. Hub drives are easy to mount and package and can be made universal enough to fit most bikes, whereas a crank drive really needs to be made for that specific bike. A hub drive, however, gets no torque multiplication or mechanical advantage from the bike's gears because it is mounted directly to the hub. When you are pedaling to assist the motor, you still receive mechanical advantage from the gearing as normal, but the motor does not. The first modification I made to this kit was to transfer over my existing knobby tire to replace the smooth street tire that came on the supplied wheel. This was a heavy bike even in its original form, coming in at around 38 to 40 pounds. With the addition of the e-bike kit and battery, the bike now weighs 58 pounds using the indisputably accurate bathroom scale on each tire method. That also revealed that 42 of it is on the back and 16 is on the front, making the weight distribution far from equal. The battery only weighs 5 to 6 pounds of that total. I'm not actually sure how long I've had this bike. I believe it's been about 10 years. I bought the bike at Target, which tells you that it's not a particularly high-end unit. It's a Schwinn S60 DSX, featuring hydroform tubing and full suspension, front and rear. Two features that were important to me in selecting this bike to modify, the full suspension and the disc brake. The suspension is actually functional and not merely cosmetic. The bike also features a disc brake, which is important as these bikes were not designed to be hauled down from 35 miles an hour repeatedly. The rear, unfortunately, is still a rubber clamp style. So, I try to use the rear for as much as it's worth and then add the front brake as needed. The instructions, precedent, and pretty much everyone else seems to mount their controller where the bottle mount normally goes. But I still wanted a bottle mount and I did not want the box and wires down there between my legs, so I mounted the controller on the underside of the battery tray. I used a couple of small mounting brackets and machine screws to mount it from the underside so that the battery slide tray could still function. I don't have a great deal of clearance between the controller and the tire, but since nothing moves or flexes in the suspension at this point, an inch should be as good as a mile as long as the tray, which looks well made, doesn't collapse. Depending on what your bike has available for mounting holes and locations, you can mount the tray directly to the bike. The purely vertical loading I achieve should prevent any flex from shock load. The supplied thumb throttle is actually a surprisingly nice unit, although the display only tells you full, half, or empty. I had originally planned to swap out the thumb throttle for a twist grip style as I'm used to that on motorcycles, but after spending some time with the thumb throttle, however, I actually prefer it now for this application. There's also a red shutoff button provided. Top speed for me, sitting upright in the wind on level ground, is about 30 miles per hour. On a downhill grade, I've reached 42 miles an hour, and even though the bike didn't vibrate or shake, it's just not designed for those speeds. I'll be honest, after having ridden this bike in traffic at speed, I really feel you should have a motorcycle license or endorsement in order to do so. I highly recommend you take a scooter or motorcycle safety course before you spend any time in traffic with one of these. It's not so much about the operation of the bike as it is learning the philosophy of operating a bike in traffic. While you already may know intellectually that when a bike and car collide, the bike loses, the courses teach you how to predict and avoid many of those collisions. You'll learn that cars will turn left in front of you and dozens of other important facts. Even if you're used to riding a bicycle in traffic, the increased speed introduces new complications. Because the controller and battery are now mounted in such close proximity to one another, the cabling runs are all very short. I basically just had to wrap up the excess cable and tie it up. I haven't done it yet, so you can still see the extent of the wiring. The biggest connection is a supplied yellow block with three wires that connect color to color between the motor and the controller. One thing that surprised me was the use of this female battery connector that looks a lot like a standard 120 volt AC connector. Since this is a 48 volt DC connection, the last thing you want to do is plug your IBM PC monitor into it, even though it appears to be the same connector. 
The battery itself locks into place with a keyed pin that interlocks with the metal tray, preventing the battery from being removed. While not indestructible, it largely prevents the need to otherwise lock up your expensive battery. The tray mount that is supplied with the battery works nicely. The battery has a receiver for the tray rails and slides into position easily. Once removed, the handle flips up for easy carrying. The charge port for the battery is located under the flip handle on the side of the battery, so you do not need to remove the battery in order to charge it. This is the extent of the wiring to the main motor, a single cable bundle that I secured to the rack rail. The bike and I combined are about 270 pounds, and I live in a hilly area. In one spot, I climb about 230 feet of elevation in a half mile, and the bike is able to manage that without any assistance. I do end up assisting the bike just by choice on the steepest hills because the speeds usually come down to a point where you can pedal in a medium gear and lend a hand. Granted, a human rider can only put out about 100 watts in theory, but it does seem like more than 10% boost and may help keep the motor from overheating. In summary, in my Amazon review, I gave the e-bike kit 4 stars and the battery, for now, a 5. If the battery lasts at its current performance, it will have earned it. The e-bike kit entirely lacks instructions, lacking even the token poorly translated hints you might be accustomed to with products from offshore. The parts included, however, appear to be of decent quality and exhibit surprisingly good performance. Presuming the parts prove to be durable, I will continue to eagerly recommend this kit with its sub-$200 price.